Hello Dr. Humans, welcome back to the channel and today's video where we will be diving into the classifications of lupus nephritis so that it actually makes sense and we actually know what's going on. And we're going to do this with a bit of a whiteboard vibe so you can scribble along with me as we go. So grab some paper and some coloured pens and let's do this. There are six classes of lupus nephritis, which are determined on renal biopsy. And it's important to know which class you're dealing with because the management of each class is slightly different. There are some classes which do not require immunosuppression and others which absolutely do. And so assigning these classifications is very useful to patient care. But another key thing to point out is the diagnostic value of a renal biopsy for lupus as a whole. You may be aware of this table that we use to diagnose patients with lupus, gathering up a series of manifestations and autoantibodies and assigning points. And you need about 10 points to qualify as having lupus, but you can see that if you have a renal biopsy showing class 3 or class 4 lupus nephritis, this is pretty much all the points you need straight away. So in that sense, a diagnosis of lupus nephritis will serve as a definitive diagnosis of lupus overall. But of course, you're not going to do a biopsy in everyone with lupus. You're going to be selective. We're only going to do biopsies in patients who have a likely diagnosis of lupus, who on regular blood and urine tests are showing changes in their renal function, hematuria or proteinuria that would make us quite suspicious of lupus nephritis and would prompt a renal biopsy. And so what might we see on that biopsy? Lupus, broadly speaking, is a disease of immune complex formation and complement activation. So there are antibodies which can deposit in tissues and draw the complement cascade and immune cells into those tissues to cause damage. And depending on where those antibodies lodge in the glomerulus, you'll have different types of histological lesions. Now, for those of you who have seen my free GN tutorial over on the website, you'll know that I have a very unique way of describing the glomerulus and drawing out all of those little glomerular diseases so that we can actually understand them. And if you have not yet experienced this GN tutorial and you're a doctor studying for exams, then you're going to need to grab that tutorial as soon as possible. It's a super fun animated tutorial where you will learn everything you need to know about GN for your exams, you'll summarize it on one page and you'll do all of this in just 40 minutes. It is a game changer and the cheat code for learning GN for your exams. So once you're done here, go ahead, click that link and grab your free GN tutorial for the win. And when it comes to lupus nephritis, all of the concepts in that GN tutorial are relevant and we can apply those here so that we really understand lupus nephritis on a deep level. So just to recap, if you have not seen the tutorial, or maybe if you watched it a while ago, we can think of the glomerulus in a couple of ways, in 3D and in 2D. For 3D, I want you to visualize a pretzel. So take a plain pretzel, that's the capillaries. Now we add some chocolate, that's the glomerular basement membrane. And then we add some icing and suddenly we have the podocytes. And in between this pretzel structure, there is supporting tissue known as the mesangium. Think of placing this pretzel onto a sponge cake. There's your mesangium. So that's the glomerulus in 3D. Super easy. And now we're going to take a little cross section of our pretzel and we're going to draw this out in 2D this time to make a little glomerular burger. So here we have our capillaries the mesangium, we have our glomerular basement membrane, and we have our podocyte. And this is the diagram that is going to be the holy grail of understanding the lupus classification system. Now we are going to place the classes of lupus onto this diagram with extreme ease. Are you ready? <laughs> the six classes of lupus nephritis are as follows. Class one and two involve the mesangium only. Class 3 and 4 involve the capillaries. Class 5 involves the glomerular basement membrane or podocytes. And class 6 means that there is scarring, sclerosis, burnt out, permanent damage to the glomerulus. So that's the rough idea. But now we're going to superimpose some more details onto this diagram. Because when we do a renal biopsy, 
We do a couple of things. First, we look at the tissue under the light microscope and see what histological patterns are there. We then stain the biopsy to look for antibodies and complement, and this can be done either with immunohistochemistry or immunofluorescence. And beyond that, we can do electron microscopy to have a really close look at what's going on. But here in Australia, we don't do electron microscopy on every sample that we send to the pathology lab. We save this only for select cases. And usually in lupus, it's not necessary to do electron microscopy to clinch the diagnosis. So if you did do EM, there are findings to be found, but I'm going to leave electron microscopy alone today because the light microscope and those stains are pretty much all we need. Now, something else I want to explain before diving deeper into the classification is the concept of mesangial cells and capillary cells proliferating in response to injury. So again, see the GN tutorial for all of your GN needs, but you'll probably have come across the term mesangial capillary GN or membranoproliferative GN. Both of these mean the exact same thing, and they describe what happens when there are immune complexes deposited in the mesangium or capillaries and they're causing inflammation as a result. This sort of inflammation to the mesangium or capillaries, for some reason, just makes these cells divide. It makes them proliferate. That is the behaviour, somehow, of an upset mesangial cell or glomerular capillary cell. They just hit the proliferate button and we can see under the microscope that we have all of these extra cells, all of these extra nuclei. So inflamed mesangial cells or capillary cells, you're going to see them proliferate in response to that. It just means they're upset and inflamed. That's it. And the other thing to say about lupus is that when we stain the biopsy for antibodies and complement, we tend to get what's known as a full house stain, meaning it lights up like a Christmas tree. And there are all sorts of antibodies and complement factors, all the things. It's a real variety pack. It's like the whole immune system got together in there for some kind of gathering. There's a massive immune party, there's full house staining, it's all happening. Now, full house staining can also occur in other situations, like infections, for example. But in that sense, the clinical picture is going to help you delineate between those scenarios. But regardless, it is important to know that lupus nephritis is associated with full house staining with a range of antibodies and complement and all the things. So from now on, we're going to call this collection of antibodies and complement immune deposits. So whenever I say immune deposits, all I'm saying is antibodies and or complement are having a party. That's it. That's what I mean. Okay, so coming back to apply this to class one and two lupus nephritis. These cases only involve the mesangium. In class one, also known as minimal mesangial lupus nephritis, the biopsy looks completely normal under the microscope. But when you stain the biopsy, you'll find immune deposits are there in the mesangium. Class 2 lupus nephritis, the biopsy does not look normal. Instead, we have mesangial cells that are inflamed and therefore proliferating. There is mesangial hypercellularity. And again, when staining is applied, we'll see those immune deposits in the mesangium. And so the other term for class 2 lupus nephritis is mesangial proliferative lupus nephritis. Interestingly, class 1 and 2 have a very good renal prognosis and they don't require specific immunosuppression. So you'll probably have these patients on hydroxychloroquine, also known as Plaquenil, but any additional immunosuppression will be guided by other manifestations of lupus outside the kidney. Now coming on to class 3 and 4 lupus, these are the ones to watch out for. These always, always, always warrant treatment and that is because they involve the capillaries and if left untreated, they are associated with a very poor renal prognosis, especially class 4. Class 4 is the absolute worst. We need to get on top of class 4 ASAP. And because both of these involve immune deposits in the capillaries, the capillaries do what capillaries do when they are upset, and that is proliferate. So these types of lupus nephritis are often termed 
proliferative lupus nephritis. And when it comes to those immune deposits, you'll see these being described as subendothelial deposits, which really just means in the capillaries, which are lined with endothelium. So subendothelial deposits, we're dealing with class three or four. And so what's the difference between these? The key difference between these is the extent of involvement. So class three lupus nephritis involves less than 50% of the glomeruli on the biopsy. And because of this, it receives the term focal proliferative lupus nephritis, whilst class four involves 50% or more of the glomeruli. And this receives the title diffuse proliferative lupus nephritis. These types of lupus nephritis tend to present as a nephritic syndrome, where we have hematuria, proteinuria, and elevated creatinine. And again, class three and four are the ones that are associated with a particularly poor renal prognosis, and we need to sort this out with immunosuppression. Of course, choosing immunosuppression depends on the individual, but it usually looks something like corticosteroids plus cyclophosphamide, or mycophenolate. So corticosteroids are always there and then either cyclophosphamide or mycophenolate depending on how severe and other factors such as uh, fertility concerns. Now coming on to class 5, we are nearly there. Class 5, also known as membranous lupus nephritis, is when those immune deposits are located in the sub-epithelial space meaning just below the podocytes, because podocytes are just a type of specialised epithelium. So here, the immune deposits are around the glomerular basement membrane and podocytes. And because of that, this type of lupus tends to present with heavy proteinuria and sometimes even nephrotic syndrome. And they may have some microhematuria as well. Now, class Five may or may not warrant immunosuppression. That really depends on whether they have either a hint of class three or four on their biopsy as well, in which case you would immunosuppress them, or if they had nephrotic range proteinuria. The current guidelines for lupus would suggest that this group of patients who have the nephrotic range proteinuria would benefit from immunosuppression. But if they don't have nephrotic range proteinuria, so they have less than three grams of protein in their urine per day, then you might just try some RAS inhibition, ACE inhibitors and ARBs and just see how they go. But otherwise, for nephrotic range proteinuria or nephrotic syndrome, we would tend to immunosuppress them in the usual way. And lastly, class six, advanced sclerosing lupus nephritis. This just means that there is greater than or equal to 90% global sclerosis and no active lupus. It's just burnt out disease. The damage is done, the kidney is scarred, and at that stage, it's really just supportive management. We do not immunosuppress these patients with class six lupus nephritis. So that was lupus nephritis classifications on renal biopsy so that we can actually understand what's going on. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit that like and subscribe button below. And don't forget, if you haven't already, be sure to head on over to the website and grab your free copy of the GN tutorial. And otherwise, I will see you again soon for some more high yield learning. Bye.